Welcome back, everyone, to the New York City Multifamily Podcast. As always, my partner and friend, Sean Reiney. Today, we are joined by Mr. Jesse Deutsch of 280 Ventures, former competitor turned developer turned rent-stabilized apartment building purchaser. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you guys both for having me. Uh, Long-time listener. Enjoy the pod. And uh, I'm ready for this. Let's go. Yeah, let's do it. So... um, just a quick background on you. You were in the brokerage business for a while, and that's kind of how we crossed paths and became friends. And then you went into the development business for a couple of years, and then you left development in 2018 to start mm-hmm. 280 Ventures to start buying apartment buildings. And you started buying stuff uh, in Upper Manhattan. Yes. And, uh, you know, when we met, uh, those were fun times. And, you know, everything that I've done since I've left the brokerage, um, you know, world is just used kind of strengths that, you know, we kind of gained from being resilient brokers competing against one another. Is there anything that you miss about being a broker? Um, you know, day to day wins, maybe, you know, I've talked to a couple of people that have done that transition to principal and they're like, you know what, especially in times like these where maybe the deals are a little thin and it's a little harder to like be on an acquisition tear. They're like, I just miss those days where I could just walk in and like produce something that might make me 40 or 50 grand. You know, if I'm, there's only so much you can lean on your management company, at least units, that's, you know, in Alabama or something. That's <laughs> in the, like, like it, hey, is that two bedroom <laughs> lease? You know, like, why not? How about showings? They're like, uh, it's Alabama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when the market was going up and and, uh, you know, the brokerage income would go up obviously a bit, but then like the syndicators, you, you know, you would be like, wow, that guy made a lot of money, like buying and selling. And then the market comes down and now it's kind of like our turn to like have our cake and eat it too a little bit. But you've been doing this since 2018. Mm-hmm. What have you, what skills from the brokerage world have helped you in the acquisition deal making mode? Yeah, I, th- I think it's remembering that, you know, if you're trying for short term success, you know, that's possible for sure, but you need long-term goals and you need to kind of remember what those are and uh, take things on a week by week basis. It's like, I kind of always compare it to, you know, today's NBA, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, if you listen to like the great ones talk like Seth, you know, Seth Curry or even like Kobe Bryant, like sound bites from him. And, um, you know, they look on a, on, you know, a day by day basis, like how can I get better today and use this in a game, right? Like how could I, you know, from a team perspective, because it's a team sport, real estate's a team sport. Mm-hmm. You guys leverage each other mm-hmm. um, and your team with Joe and and everyone that's that's kind of associated to get more business and to perform on the business. And that's the most important aspect is to perform. So, so what are some of those micro wins in the the ownership world that like today, this afternoon, you're not going to buy a building this afternoon, maybe you will, but you know, what are some of those definable small victories that you're trying to improve every week? Yeah. I mean, you know, when you buy a building, um, the harsh reality is, is that there are so many different ways which the expenses are going up and, you know, regulations are kind of constricting, you know, if you're doing nothing with the asset, right, Mm -hmm. what eventually the expenses will be versus, you know, what you can anticipate the income to be. So, you know, you have to do something, right? There are so many things that are out of your control, um, you know, but which is, you know, kind of taught to you in the brokerage world you know, with no apology, right? Um, You know, you could pitch somebody business and say, you could leave and say, you know what, that could not have gotten better. I learned something from it. Hopefully they did too. If nothing else, you know, they learned that I'm in this, you know, to do the best for both of us. Um, But sometimes that's not enough. It doesn't mean that things are going to go your way. So, you know, you have to find on the short term things that will improve the bottom line so that you could kind of gain that extra um, you know, yard or two with regards to, you know, waiting out some things, you know, playing, swinging back into your favor. Right. I, yeah. I really liked, you know, how you define that. You, you have the right mentality. And just again, just to back up the truck a little bit, Jesse has purchased over 400 rent stabilized units in the last, you know, few years. We've had uh, some of the sellers that he's bought from on the pod recently. Um, you know, and, and I guess one of the questions when it comes down to rent stabilized housing, you're one of the, you know, I guess fewer active purchasers, although I think there's starting to be a buildup of people that are looking back into the space. Like, is there something that you see other than the long-term necessity to change laws that other people may not see in rent regulated? Like, why buy rent regulated now? Yeah, I, I mean, look, you know, something that I want to kind of uh, highlight from what Seth was saying before is that um, I did leave. So when 
when uh, I transitioned from brokerage into the uh, development world, I was at a, a smaller shop that uh, had an impact on affordable housing. Um, and Azimuth, right. And, um, you know, that was for two years and it was a really active two years um, and picked up a lot of skill sets and mindsets from there as well. And, um, you know, from that sense, it's, you know, things change quicker than than you could kind of remember they did in the past, mm -hmm. you know, when you're in it. Mm -hmm. Right. And and then there are things that kind of never change, but you have to kind of recognize, you know, in the in the moment, you know, what's more you know, realistic to kind of change and kind of go with the trend mm -hmm. uh, from that sense. And, um, you know, I think that from the level of how you sell a building and the metrics that you're looking at and when you're pitching an investor on whether or not it's a viable opportunity, I think one of the biggest kind of commonalities, and you and I talk about this all the time, is like the craziness that even after 2019, um, when, you know, the rent laws drastically changed um, and will leave the subjective better or worse out of it for a moment. Um, but I think I know where, you know, all of us kind of stand on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, multiples, rent multiples were still um, 10, 11 significant. Times, yeah. you know, after they the were round. double digit, yeah. Yeah. right? So yes, things continue to change for the worse in terms of regulations, but the one main factor that changed were, were interest rates, yeah. right? And lender willingness and, you know, the, the catch up of, of having or allowing a lender to kind of catch up to today's regulations and what that means for them and their bank. Mm -hmm. um, and you have kind of this dynamic in the appraisal market, right? That kind of shifts and impacts the way that lenders are willing to kind of participate in this market. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that interest rates are high right now, one of the most challenging components of buying a property, which hopefully the lister kind of recognizes and embraces in a way is that you really have to budget up front in order to kind of wait out that day that, you know, hopefully is the most simplistic kind of uh, short term future opportunity, which is, you know, the multiple to return when interest rates swing back. Um, right, right. Where there's an upside mechanism. So you're saying you just basically have to have a reserve account when you're buying these rent stabilized buildings, much more than a typical building for the unforeseen repair, the local law work, mm -hmm. the this and the that. Yeah, let's. Um You've typically shied away from buildings that require local law 11. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Because um, I think I've got you back into the swing <laughs> of things because a lot of them require it. But how do you, right, your email gets flooded with setups and opportunities. How do you kind of instinctively distinguish where to spend time on and where not to be like interested or spend time on? Yeah, I, that's a, a really good question because, you know, it's something that is also evolving. Um, as you just pointed out, you know, we're now looking at things that, you know, do require uh, the heavier set of local law treatment. And, um, you know, we're, we're still buying both, you know, things that, you know, are underneath um, the parameters for which, you know, you're kind of taxed by the additional requirements um, and things that have. And I think that it plays into one, you know, commonality, which is location. Um, it's such a hard business, you know, for you to, you know, just purely buy something um, as a spectator and just say, I'm going to, you know, go into Williamsburg and buy this uh, six family. And I'm going to go into um, Washington Heights and buy this 12 family. And at the East Village, you know what? That's a great eight family. Someone's got to manage it all. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so. And not only does someone have to manage it all, you could have three different property management companies. It's it's not necessarily it's you you have to be the asset manager though. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? Um, and things don't necessarily work when they're one off, right? Yeah. Um, there's so much benefit that you get when the properties are kind of clustered, and from it might be it might start out as somewhat unintentional, but you got to pick the location first, right? So. Right. A lot of what or we kind of your flag. Yeah, a lot of what we do is just try to stay disciplined in terms of, you know, picking the right location, right. Um, and a lot of it plays into right now, you know, where we currently are, right? And I mean, we talked about this uh, before, and I was telling you, Sean, uh, recently, just the affinity for um, Northern Manhattan, mm -hmm. um, and I think one thing from a buyer's perspective. And I, I know the question is really about the local laws, but it's about how to kind of uh, cut through the clutter mm -hmm. and then first pick. And um, location, you know, for me, it's it's always been, would I live here, 
right? Does the location have, you know, what it takes for me to be happy living here? Do, or to visit the property in general. Or to visit, right. or to visit the property in general. You're not going to buy it. Right. Such a, such a forgotten kind of concept is collections, right? But in order to kind of collect is, you know, the tenant has to be happy that, you know, if they're saving up to move, right, because yeah. it's a horrible place to live, they're not going to pay you your rent. They're going to hope that you're, you know, going to yeah. cut them a deal to leave. Um, so, you know, you have to do the right things and, and starts with, you know, for yourself and then also for, for the tenants and location's a big part of it. Location. And then what's the next telling metric? Are you looking at GRM, price per unit or cap rate? Yeah, I mean, look, replacement cost is always uh, top of the list. So um, price per unit, price per square foot. Price per unit, price per square foot. And price per unit is a deceptive one because it's not just what the current unit dynamic is, mm -hmm. right? Um, it used to be, um, and when I say used to be, a couple of months ago, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, it used to be that price per unit is a, a powerful tool where, um, you know, when you buy a building that has leftover density, Mm -hmm. So you buy a 10,000 square foot building that has a density for 18 units, right? But it only has 10, right? Or 12 right now. Mm -hmm. Tax class two already, right? And then you have the apartments that vacate and there's an easy path to, you know, dividing and, and, and adding to the unit count that doesn't necessarily impact the taxes that you're paying because it's already tax class two. Right. 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 Interesting. Yeah. And you, you still do, even though they eliminated the ability to combine two rent stabilized apartments, you do still have areas in upper Manhattan and the Bronx and where there's large units where they are side by side. It does make sense to split them into two because you're just not going to get the same rent for a big four bedroom as you are two regular sized two bedrooms. Yeah. Period. Well, we've toured a bunch of buildings recently and on the tours, um, you've talked about this and to my initial reaction to that as well, like you must have a really long term outlook if this is the type of thing that you're talking about on a tour. So when you go into one of these assets to purchase, how are you viewing how long you're going to own it? And, mm -hmm. you know, are you thinking, oh, my kids will own, th own this 50 years from now? Because um, you've got, it's not like it's just you buying it, right? You're raising some money. So like, how are you approaching the hold? Yeah, what's and, the exit? you know, what's the exit strategy? Oh, wow. I mean, uh, to my investors listening, you know, hopefully, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a gamble, right? It's a gamble yeah. on some com if I can speak for you, right. It's some common sense returning to the necessity of housing. And we have, you know, Seth and I were talking, it's like, we have the natural resource called water. There just needs to, everyone just needs to realize that they're getting thirsty and just go to the place that there's water. Yeah. We have the aquifer yeah, called housing point. in New York City. We still own it and we can be a partner with you and in, in the government in providing affordable housing. That plus interest rates, plus a little, you know, mm -hmm. some, a bunch of things on the margin, plus a little bit of interest rate compression. Then we got a voila. And, and voila. This is the cheapest some of these buildings have sold for in I can't recent, remember. Recent yeah, like are, even are, in 2009. You're marketing a 230 unit with ocean views in Brighton Beach for seven times, 6.7 .7 times rent roll. This is a property that was purchased for 44 million. We're on the market for 31 yeah, million. Yeah, this is going to sell for like six and change times. Well, I think it'll sell for close to ass, Seth, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but Please, it just shows you. Not, and the, I, I challenge you. And Let's. the profile of this seller is very similar to how everyone in 2024 is going to be selling. The market hit a very clear shift after Labor Day, when higher for longer seemed to be the modus operandi. Mm -hmm. And what that means for banks and for borrowers is, you know, we can't just hold out. The banks aren't willing to do the extend another year type of thing. They want their 3% paper back so they can go relend it out at 7% mm -hmm. because that's how they make money. Yeah. And this whole idea of, you know, you can work with the bank. The bankers are not necessarily your friends. They're the people you went to golf with are not the people you're speaking to anymore. So, yeah. The debt maturities are real and people have to get real tactical and start these processes. But there's a lot of forced sales and I haven't seen forced sales in 15 years since yeah, the, really the GFC. And even then it was probably this, easier to sell. Yeah, th this is coming and um, there's really no way around it, right? Because oftentimes the the values are worth so much below the debt or not even like worth the debt. Sometimes right. they're worth significantly below the debt. So like this has, something has to give. It's been almost, it's been four and a half years since HSTPA. It's been uh, almost three years since interest rates were at zero and people were borrowing at two and a half and 3%. Um, so this is coming right now. But one of the things that you and I, Sean, were talking about the other day is, and you can talk about this too, like, um, 
during COVID, we sold a whole bunch of buildings for people who uh, were like, wow, it's time to move on. I can still get 10 times the rent roll for this mm -hmm. rent stabilized apartment building. And there was a lot of activity. Like we had a lot of bids at 10, nine and 10 times the rent roll in the secondary and tertiary markets. Today at six and seven times the rent roll, it feels like we have half the level of interest on these same buildings than we did two years ago at nine and 10 times the rent roll. Yeah. And the people that were buying them two years ago were like, well, I'm going to buy this for the long term. So what's the difference? Well, why don't you buy them now at six and seven times the right. rental if you have the same business strategy? What? How is today different than maybe two years ago? What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, and this kind of goes to the last question as well. But a, a partner of mine loves this this saying. It's it's cliche. It's it's old school. But you know, you marry the building, you bought you date you rate. date the rate, right? And that statement is more powerful than ever right now. Because, um, you know, you kind of could edit it a little bit to include the bank in there too, mm -hmm. right? But I think right now it's it's about setting up, you know, if you could look at a property and you could underwrite it where you take the elements of the local laws and what they're, re they're actually requesting of the building stock to improve themselves, right? Mm -hmm. To essentially cut down on the repairs and maintenance budget because you're making the improvements up front, right? Mm -hmm. And to cut down on, on some... Well, theoretically, operating expenses, you know, prior to DEP and and Con Ed just jacking the rates up after you make those improvements, right? right. right? <laughs> Energy um, efficient. Oh, we're going to change the assessment yeah. rate. Yeah, yeah. You spend money, therefore you have more. We're going to tax you. Yeah, we're going to raise <laughs> we're going to raise the, the the water and sewer rate by by nine percent this year. You no, know, no um, biggie. Yeah, no biggie. I know everyone's you know after the last couple of hurricanes improving their um, you know buildings leak uh, possibilities, but in any case, you know it's it's it is. Well, there's a lot of truth to it in that, you know, it gets fleeting when you start thinking about the, the way that you can make improvements, you know, during the time after you bought the investment between, you know, the margins, right? Between the next time that you refi versus kind of capitalizing up front for what could go wrong. So when you kind of marry that concept to local law 97 or, or local law 11, you know, or, you know, kind of the, the litany of, of different requirements that are required from from landlords today, you're kind of met with the, the possibilities of, wait a second, I'm budgeting for these things up front anyway, right? I'm gonna meet you know the requirements in the process and I should theoretically have an easier time managing the building. Um, and if you could budget up front with that, which today- Budget up front is a key component yeah, of this. When you're buying something on a 6X, right? And you're budgeting up front for these concepts, then all of a sudden, yeah, maybe you know the underlying basis is close to, closer to a seven and eight. But we just covered how in a lower interest rate environment, um, you have the 12, 13, 14, 15 uh, x possibilities, yeah. right? And for me, it's not about selling. To answer your other question about what's you know the long term outlook, it's really about you know will it meet the appraisals uh, standards and will it meet the the bank's comfort level in three to five years when when interest rates do return to refinance, to, and, and to, refinance to hold long term, mm -hmm. but then also to repatriate the equity so that we could put it back to play. Right. You know, in, um, real estate is, it has its compounding benefits, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, that is the pure difference between real estate and the traditional sense of which people trade stocks and commodities and mutual funds and, and all, you know, the like, right? What are you finding, you know, today as far, because I'm hearing a lot of fear and complaints that it's basically impossible to get a loan outside of Fannie or Freddie, that the regional banks are keeping deals and investment committee for months on end. Every week, it's a new question about a PFS statement or some expense. Have you had experience? Like, is, is there a relatively healthy debt market for rent regulated housing or has it gotten thin pickings? Like what's that experience of financing like this year? Yeah, it's, um, you know, no country for old men for sure. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it could, it could feel very isolated when you're out there and, and you're trying to rely on, you know, common sense in all aspects of what you're doing. Right. And it's so hard to rely on it with buying buildings from everything that we just talked about, you know, the Con Edison concept, the DEP concept. And then when you get to the bank concept, it's, you could, you know, kind of throw your head through the wall when, when you understand, wait a second, this works, right? The most common thing uh, that banks say is, oh, well, we need to reserve for this upfront because, you know, the expenses are rising. So the building's not going to be profitable. Well, really? Did you do that math? Because it takes 80 years for expenses to catch up to income. 
-hmm. if you do nothing with the building to improve the income, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you just assume a compounding 3% return, right. you know, yeah. each year. And yeah, sure, grow the expenses, you know, I'm sorry, a compounding 2%, yeah. grow the expenses at 3%. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. The top line is still bigger than the the top line, line is still bigger line. for 80 years. Right. Mm -hmm. You're only going to be in it for five. Mm -hmm. Right. So why is it so challenging for you to get behind it? Once you kind of find the banks that are willing to proactively get behind that um, and understand that this is just such a unique buy opportunity for so many people in the market. Right. Mm -hmm. You do find people. Um, we shy away, you know, from trying to, you know, kind of go with one lender because it it's hard. You know, that's the hard thing to do in a market like this um, because lenders, as you just kind of pointed out, change their investment committees, change the way that they want to place money. Right. Right. Um, so I would say, no, there's definitely more than Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you could find a bank that is willing to uh, participate on a three year loan. Mm -hmm. Right. Just to get through this period, yeah. It's going to help you with the prepays anyway. Right. Um, so if you really believe that things are going to move on a shorter term, hmm. um, you're going to have the ability to actually do something when things arise on the shorter term. Um, you know, but I would say, you know, for me, when I, whenever I'm kind of, you know, contemplating who the lender is going to be, it's, you know, that's the biggest part is, um, you know, can they get behind? Are they willing to kind of move aside from, um, you know, where the building's economics are going to be in five years when we both know, you know, it's going to be fine for them. Right. You know, yeah. Given today's they're environment. Scared. They're, they're forecasting almost more pessimism than needs to be the case potentially. Um, you know, that's definitely a challenge. It's almost like every single component is stress tested. You know, you got equity re requiring far greater returns. They want to be convinced they're buying a steal. You have, you know, debt, you know, the bank's putting expenses in that have never seen, you know, brokers set up. I mean, I compare mm -hmm. our setups in 2015 to 2017 on the expense ratio to, you know, compared to now, and we were showing stuff at 35%, you know, expenses. Now it's 60 yeah. or 65. I mean, it really does feel like if this isn't the bottom in rent regulated housing, I always am challenging investors. Like, don't you think it's the bottom quartile? Like, don't you think we're in the bottom 25% of the trough? Because you're never going to time the bottom correctly, but you should try to time the bottom quartile. And are we maybe not in the highest quartile of value for free market that have been maybe artificially propped up higher than they otherwise would because of lack of supply? There hasn't been almost, you know, five years of not turning over apartments. Yeah. So right. if they do change those laws, will free market kind of settle down? I mean, in theory, that's what should happen, supply and demand. So... There's there's definitely a clear arbitrage or contrarian bet to be making when rent regulated is anywhere between six to eight times rent roll and at its zenith was 17 to 18 times rent roll. Yeah. And a building that's rent regulated is 100 a foot and a free market counterpart is 1,000 a foot. That polarity in pricing is fever pitch. Yeah, it's something has to give there. It's a good point. I remember talking to like several older guys in the business and one of the things that they've said about their you know career like 30 40 year career is that they bought in every market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they bought in 2007 and they bought in 2009 and the same periods throughout history and if you just like dollar cost average it and you look at real estate over a really extended period mm -hmm. of time you've done exceedingly well. And the same thing would be true if you just bought the stock market. If you look at the yeah. Dow over Average its entire Dow. history, it, it returns 10%, mm -hmm. post, uh, including inflation at 6% mm -hmm. over its entire history. So it doesn't matter in a way in, in the microcosm of what it feels like on a daily or monthly time period. Yeah, like there's going to be time periods where it totally stings and you're like, oh, why did I do that? Or mm -hmm. I should have done this. But in the long scheme, if you're looking... Uh, several decades, it's fine. Yeah. And actually, you know, when you think about kind of uh, that same concept, it's um, you're averaging down, right? Yeah. So a lot of the investors that are out there are people that kind of want to enter into real estate and they see the benefits of it because in their industry, they have to make that decision on a much shorter term basis, right? And oh, make that bet yeah. on a short term basis. So for them, it, it is an exciting buy opportunity. And to kind of build off the question that you asked before as well, um, you know, I think that a lot of people, when you come into a, a scenario where you're pumping more equity in the deal than they're used to seeing, um, 
you know, the capitalization of the deal withstand or, or kind of enter into a purchase with, it excites them because, you know, to kind of show that lower leverage opportunity and we kind of control our fate somewhat, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, we actually, we made some acquisitions that were purely all cash and, mm. um, it allows you to kind of structure the deal in a way where all of a sudden you build in pref equity, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is pref equity? Well, it's an ability for the investor to act also as a lender from a sense because um, they're making a guaranteed return, right? Um, which is absolutely guaranteed by the fact that there's no lender that- And does the pref equity term have a term on it? Like, or is it just a, a percentage owed, but it doesn't have like a, hey, I'm giving you pref equity at 8%, but it's three years and I want to be out. Is it, is it just like a forever thing? No, I mean, the concept going into it is that um, the investor and us, you know, share the, uh, the goal of bringing in uh, a bank gotcha. um, at some bank. point yeah. to take them out. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to force that decision. And it's with capital that they're comfortable making that guaranteed 7, seven to 8 percent return on. So this goes back to what you've always said is that cash is king. And you've mm -hmm. like on those transactions, you have ultimate flexibility. Yeah. Right. There's you have no no one breathing down your neck and your partners are you know, aligned with you. And this is where you're going to see the real rich guys like you yeah, I mean, if you can offer, if you can offer well. I mean, the question we're typically getting from our sellers on large rent regulated properties is who is the buyer? Like, what is mm -hmm. the buyer type? Because they don't trust a syndicator's ability to go collect the funds. They want somebody that maybe is a high net worth family office that can actually cut a check or doesn't require financing because they know. You know, typically you got to go source the rest of the capital stack, and it's very difficult to put that stack together. Yeah. So you don't find out what the problem is until like you're two weeks like before <laughs> closing, right? And then everyone's like, oh, I didn't know this. I didn't and know that. Exactly. You got a problem. The deal falls apart. Like, And that's what's interesting because we haven't seen really the true all cash funds uh, come into New York City the way that we kind of saw some newer groups in 2012, 13, 14, 15 that are saying, hey, I have $100 million to deploy. I'm going to cut a check. We'll refinance when it when it happens. But the money's already pre-committed. Yeah. There's a huge opportunity to brand yourself in the marketplace if you can, like Jesse said, you know, cut a check for some buildings because you're going to get every broker's call if we don't have to wait 120 days and sellers can get the peace of mind of clearing out their, their debt before the debt matures. And there isn't really that many people. And I think it just goes to the sense of, you know, some of the New York City real estate owners have less equity because they're on defensive positions or dealing with the avalanche of debt that's hitting them. And there's like that new capital hasn't necessarily found its way to New York City. It will 100% find its way to mm -hmm. New York City as soon as there's some meat on the bone with the rent regulated business plan. They will be foaming at the mouth yeah. to get back in. Yeah. And in a healthy way, in a way that, you know, we're going to go pump money into these buildings. But, um, you know, there's just less money to go around. People are realizing if I have 10 million of liquidity, six of that has to be for defensive positions. It's hard to play defense and offense on one time. So totally. there's always somewhere in the world that's making money. It just needs to find its way to, to New York City. Where um, you've got a whole bunch of partners that mm -hmm. you've nurtured relationships with for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, where is some of the equity coming from? Because you kind of alluded to the yeah. fact that these your partners aren't necessarily rent stabilized building owners who have been in the, uh, this business for a long time. How are you sourcing these relationships and what are their expectations going into these deals with you? Yeah. And actually, it's a great point because one thing that um, I learned from a prior employer is, you know, real estate when you're investing in it is about three different risks and how to tackle it, right? It's the finance risk, the market risk, and the construction risk. And there's construction in nearly everything that you do. So, you know, one thing, commonality, um, is even though they weren't necessarily uh, rent stabilized buyers, you know, I strategically partner with um, the guys at Central Construction, for example, um, who are, you know, mid to large size um, facade restoration company. And um, they were missing the other two aspects of mm -hmm. that, right? Oh, interesting. So um, from a finance and market risk perspective, it becomes easier to tackle a lot of issues when, you know, you kind of make a dynamic team to help overcome things that are changing and evolving. Um, and I think that that gives comfort when, you know, kind of combined with the cash is king concept, right? And the approach um, to investors. The thing about investors right now is that as much as they, want to believe in the rah-rah New York City capabilities and, and opportunity. Um, 
right now, inflation and you know high interest rates are making it challenging for uh, business owners in every industry to have that kind of dis- discretionary capital to make mm-hmm. certain bets. Mm-hmm. So you know, from you know the portion of the deal that we're bringing in that's not you know the high net worth uh, um, partner and the combination of the strategic partners from from that uh, friends and family kind of um, portion of the deal. Um, there is there's a higher desire, but there's there's less, less capability. discretionary cap- capability today because of the constraints on their own businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I would say that the you know who are the investors? They're the people that have seen this happen so many times before mm-hmm. and really have faith mm-hmm. in the pendulum sw- sw- you know swinging back. Mm-hmm. And it, it happened in their own industry. Therefore, mm-hmm. it's easy to remember that this is you know. Right now, New York City is at a weird kind of point in time where. What do you mean? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm joking. No, yeah. I'm joking. no, I mean I, I know that you know th- there's a, a time limit to this podcast too, and we could we could spend days talking about mm-hmm. this. But the three of us love New York City. We live and breathe New York City. You know, you can't be a salesperson um, and sell a product you don't believe in, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And that's why to be an investment sales broker is like the most exciting thing in New York mm-hmm. City because there's so much to get excited about in New York City, right? Um, but right now. It's a, it's a funny time. Yeah. Right. And uh, will it return? Absolutely. How right? have you noticed, just kind of dovetailing to that, and then we're going to wrap up in a second. How have you noticed the bid process today versus, say, 12 or 24 months ago? Is it different? Is there anything that you can point to in your experience when going and trying to buy a deal that maybe uh, is new today yeah. that wasn't there um, two years ago? I think this also builds off the question you asked before about how you know your inbox gets cluttered, right? So it's not just um, the marketing material that you're getting; it's also who's sending it, right? So and filter by relationship more than even subject line. I could say two times rent roll, Upper Manhattan, hundred unit building. You might not open that one before you open a regular email from Seth Glasser, just because you know Seth Glasser and you know he can deliver, and he's not just you know whack a mole. Yeah, we've we've transacted. Cool. Three, nearly four times, <laughs> nearly four times, hopefully at the end of next week, yeah, right? Yes. And, um, you know, there's a lot to be said about that where, um, you know, you know the approach, you know that well, there has to be substance behind the setup, right? Yeah, totally. Um, and the paperwork has to be there. And yeah. right now, today, it's more about the paperwork than it's ever been. Do you think that the new 2015 amendments are like, I know it just happened, but it basically says the HR themselves that we're only going to look back to 2015 to establish the base year rent for overcharge claims or for the deregulation status of the unit. To me, that was extremely impactful in the market that we'll see how, you know, I wrestle with the, the attorneys in terms of like the, the definition of that. But it almost was like DHCR raising their hand saying, we cannot handle the flood of mm-hmm. all these frivolous complaints pre-2015. The law was discarded. Record retention rule is four-year look back. So if I don't have to prove anymore about how a unit became free market mm-hmm. in 2010, as long as it clearly, you know, dropped off the registration after 2000, that opens up a lot of brokerage and buying opportunities because I think that the risk is, again, limited. We'll see if Hochul signs or she's not even asked to sign. They haven't called up the Regina repealer bill, but essentially I, it's highly doubtful that they will because DHCR just went and did it themselves. They said, this is what our policy is going to be. So maybe that due diligence colonoscopy that we're all used to <laughs> will get a little easier. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, look, it's, uh, we always, when it comes to paperwork, buildings have traded. A lot of the buildings that keep trading have traded before, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's about looking at the right things, I think too. You know, it's hard because when you look at the dynamic of like what's published for violations or tenant complaints, or uh, you can kind of find the issues, Mm -hmm. right? And there are landlords that mean well and that do well in terms of the paperwork, Mm -hmm. but then they still have the AEP program and all the violations and Mm -hmm. you still have the tenants that are hiring the attorneys, you know, Mm -hmm. stressing that they've been overcharged. Mm -hmm. Um, That's a luck of the draw situation. Totally a luck of the draw. Um, One tenant can just make up whatever they want. Yeah. And I'm, kind of weary sometimes of the buildings that everything looks too perfect. Oh, interesting. right. Oh, um, it just means that it hasn't happened for them. Yet, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of cool strike. Yeah. E- yeah. Even if DHCR, you know, did the look back for 30 years, as they were saying, or just remove the look back period altogether. There's so much, you know, handholding that would need to be involved. Right. right. DHCR needs to understand what they're looking at as well. 
you know, you have to send uh, the approved plans and the paperwork from DOB, which do exist for a lot of these buildings mm -hmm. too. You know, pictures. Um, there are a lot of things that do exist. So then, once they have all these things that exist, well, let's say you know these come to fruition and people are hit with uh, overcharge. Uh, allegations and things of that nature. Well, how are they going to determine that there was an overcharge that actually occurred, that these things haven't actually, right? Right. right. So, um, you know, I think when you look from that perspective, it's the same kind of concepts that we already talked about. It's, you have to have conviction in, in what you're looking at from the paperwork perspective. You have to, you know, kind of dive in deeper than ever, but then also budget up front for the things that you can't mm -hmm, control. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you can't necessarily worry about the things you can't control. You have to worry about the things in the short term that you can. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I just want to commend you, actually. You're very diligent. We've done a bunch of deals together. You asked the right questions, not only on the leases and the IAI documentation, but uh, just the bricks themselves. Nothing to do with like local law 11, local law X, Y, and Z. Like you're asking all of that, you're getting all that documentation. So um, from an investment standpoint, if I was giving you money, I would feel very confident. I don't even know Thank if you. your investors know <laughs> what you do, right? And to like put these deals together, because it is like a spider web of information that you all kind of have to like, that you, you as um, the guy putting it together has to do a good job and, and you do do a good job. So kudos to you. Well, I really appreciate yeah. that. And, you know, if there's one thing I could add to that, uh, just as far as my investors are concerned, is that, you know, they've seen me go to the end of the earth and back, you know, on so many different things yeah. that have nothing to do with them. Yeah, you dive, you dive deep so, on, on a lot a, of that stuff. It's a crucial point. I mean, just sitting you know, with you, the optimism for the space comes across. And I think that if you are an LP looking to get into this space or you are just looking to get this space, period, go with somebody that has positive energy towards it. And a lot of the current buyer pool, for better or worse, are jaded. They're beat up. They don't want it. They've been through the, the, you know, the trenches and they just don't want to get back in the trenches again. Yeah. And somebody coming in with a relatively fresh balance sheet with, you know, new partners. And again, just, it seems like contrarian, but it's like, this has got to be the bottom quartile. If it's not the bottom 10% or the absolute bottom for rent regulated pricing, you know, this could be a big boom. So I wish you the best. Yeah, totally. Sean, why don't you wrap it up with a fun question here? For Jesse. Uh, <laughs> one quick question. Mayor Adams is here. What's the first thing you ask him to do? It can be very simple or it can be very high level and it can't be the change the rent loss. Yeah, no, I, I would say, you know, he just like all of us need to, you know, he needs to kind of look at the chips that he has available uh, to him too, right? So I'm sure all of us are reading about, you know, the BSA uh, submissions that are going in about the changing zoning in so many different capacities, you know, one of which that I hope that my colleagues in the development world don't shoot me for saying, but, you know, it's like the parking requirement, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and negating that. Well, we still need parking, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what what are the effects, what are the impacts that, that that's going to have, right? Mm -hmm. Well, there are a lot of people that if the initiative is to create affordable housing, well, he has a lot of power at his fingertips. He could either, you know, barter with that powder uh, with that power mm -hmm. and say you know what the cost of building especially at the state level where um you know you don't have the abatements that are free flowing at this point um there are restrictions to building that people don't make the income back right and banks are having a, a hard mm -hmm. time underwriting so we could remove those restrictions but let's get what we want too right mm -hmm. and um i would say that you know be more open-minded um, to the short-term goals of the people that are investing back into the city mm -hmm. and provide more opportunity for them to kind of have that level of communication about real things that are going to impact your goals to create more affordable housing and our goals to mm -hmm. kind of not lose our shirts. Right. So right? Stop playing for a second term. Let's get some stuff done. Let's Love get some it. stuff well done. Well said. All right, guys. Thank you very much for joining us, Jesse. Really appreciate it. Rainey, as always, this is fun. Thanks, Thanks guys. for having me, guys. Jesse.